least of of good information, and we pray that it would be profitable for your glory and our good. Thank you for Dr. Arnold and his uh, setting up this Zoom meeting, and uh, we do pray that uh, each student now, as we're really coming to this class with different cares and uh, different uh, thoughts throughout our day in different time zones, that you would really unite us and be able to allow us to work together. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Great. Well, I just, well, I wouldn't say anything else than just so good to see everybody. And I was just listening to your introductions you were doing. And um, it was wonderful to see that Ken was in uh, Cambodia. And I'm just so exciting the ministries that, that uh, these men have. So I'm just looking forward to a good lecture. Amen. Absolutely. Um, brother, I, brother David, I apologize here. Uh, brother David came in a little bit ago. Brother David studied here uh, with us as well for two years, right? And um, what, I mean, a very hardworking student. You just put a lot of time. The classes here. It was really my honor to spend time with him and uh, to be in, to teach classes that he was in and uh, interact with him. So, and then now he's back in Myanmar um, and serving there and you know, really working, really working hard. Um, we could take time. I could show you the pictures of things that he's doing, efforts he's doing. He's pouring himself into the ministry there, the work mm -hmm. there. And I mean, Brian, Brother Brian, Dr. Brian, uh, and the others of you as well, just to give you a sense of, you know, I mean, there's specific things here at BJMBC that um, I have very much benefited from and Dr. K has taken and implemented in our program. And so specific things we can point to that we're doing here that are an extension of, you know, work that you have done and others have done in teaching us. So, I mean, really very specific things that the Lord has um, allowed us to broaden out in the program as a result of this, this work. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. You know, this, this is, this is really helpful to get a, get a feel for who's, who we've gathered here today. And uh, we, you know, we just had last night, at uh, church, an exciting report from Brother McKenzie in Germany, where your brother is, and all the things the Lord is doing there, and then to wake up this morning and come here and connect with you and these men that you are working alongside, it's it's great. It's great. Great. Okay. Um, there's more I can talk about and more I want to talk about in terms of the program, where we're headed, and um, that some of that stuff has, it's come into focus um, greater details as far as uh, layout per year. We've got the rest of this year is laid out and even the multi-year plan we've got. Um, a lot of those things have come out in more detail and you know Dr. Oberlin and I've had the opportunity to meet uh, different times sometimes in person last year being there and then uh, over mm -hmm. Skype and stuff. So we've been you know meeting recurrently to try to map and where this goes but it's come into more some more detail. Here's actually what I want to do because we have you on. Uh, I just want to use the time. I want to maximize the time with you. Mm -hmm. And then in a future lecture where <laughs> we don't have um, so illustrious a guest, then we'll use that time to <laughs> we'll use that time to try to um, to jump into some of those details. But really, I just you're here. I want to use the, your time. I do need for the sake of some continuity. Uh, let me just show real quick. And you you men have already seen because I sent it along. And some of this will develop and change. Um, in fact, actually, right, this right here has changed the order of what we're doing here. But um, like next week, or yeah, next week, we'll plan to have Dr. Stikes. Uh, coming up from that, we'll have kind of a group discussion. So several of us, Dr. Obu and myself, uh, Dr. Threlfall coming in. Duncan Johnson spoke. He came in one time and talked to us about, um, it was the eternal generation of the sun issue. But he's really sharp with technology, formatting, and these kind. Of, he works as a publisher now. Um, so he's coming in. He's going to talk to us about Zotero and then some other just technology things, how to get your documents set up and correct, correctly and so forth. So anyway, basically, that's the time if you, you've got Word troubles, Microsoft Word troubles, that's the time to kind of store those questions away. Um, Rick Mansfield is a person I know from Accordance, and I've heard him do some presentations, really he's done a great job with presenting Accordance. And so he'll come in and do some talk with us. Then Mark Ward, you're acquainted with, he'll come in and do some talk, uh, some talking with us about the class. So I, that's what we have coming up. Um, and the, the schedule of lectures is going to be excellent. I'm, I'm extremely excited about that for my own benefit. 
Um, so, you know, I selfishly uh, enjoy planning these courses because then I get to enjoy the benefit of the fruits of the different guys that we have come in. It's great. Um, but on the other hand, the other thing I want to mention here on our opening, our goal here is to create like your prospectus or your first chapter of your final paper. So, you know, we did the, this last time where you did, I think, six different papers, seven different papers last year. Um, and this first class of each year, each cycle, the goal is, okay, we dig in a little bit more. It's a smaller group. I don't advertise this out to others. It's just kind of a little you know, more, more focused group. But the goal here is for us to write, do a lot of writing. And for, to that end, we'll only meet once a week. Um, so, so you know that. So we have a heads up. And I'll talk a little bit more at the end of our time here today about preparing for the next lecture, what that looks like. That, that's kind of the goal. If someone has a question or comment, drop that in the chat. We can roll with it. Um, okay, and then Dr. Collins, I'm, I'm going to pull in the questions that we plan to cover here. And again, for, for us to get an interview or uh, overview a bit, um, what that looks like and how we're planning to use this lecture time. The overview here is to explain the process, finding a topic, narrowing the topic, uh, through tertiary literature and so forth. And then we have these underneath, you know, just breaking that down, finding a topic, topic, narrowing a topic and so on. So what we're looking at here underneath these different points, uh, the overview, how do you get into a paper? Where do you start? Um, in future lectures with uh, Dr. Stikes and others, we'll break into more detail here. But let me hit you with this initial, just the finding the topic. And this is, I think, the thing that probably intimidates PhD students the most, um, could anyway. So uh, we talk about this concept with finding a topic. It has to be original contribution. The idea in theory, uh, it's something that nobody has written on before, or it's something new. You're contributing something new to the conversation. So it's not just a recycling as in, well, there's six books on this, I'll write you know, another paper. Um, and so talk to me about that as far as what, what does original contribution mean? How original? Um... Yeah. So the, um, you, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a danger uh, when you talk about doing an original contribution uh, for, for theology. Uh, I, I recall reading, um, I think it was R.C. Sproul, in an article, he said, "You know, that's not really a good idea to try to be original when you're doing when you're doing theology." Uh, but there are ways that you actually can do um, something that that is original, uh, that that's actually advancing the discipline. That that may be a little better way to way to put it, that you're actually advancing your discipline uh, with your thesis. What I did with mine was I picked up something that was um, that was a, a current controversy. Um, so I, I looked at, uh, in my dissertation, I looked at what uh, is often labeled theological interpretation of scripture, which I won't get into describing because it's a fairly incohate, not really unified thing. But there was a lot of debate about what this thing should be. And in relation to that, there was a lot of debate about how we should think about things like hermeneutics and like um, the role of tradition in the church and how biblical and systematic theology should function together. And when I was covering things, when I was covering those topics in the dissertation, I don't know that I was breaking new ground just by themselves, um, but I was doing something original in bringing all of that together in a critique about a specific movement. So that's one way that you can, you can do something that's original. Um, sometimes it's just original because you are doing uh, something that is that is a critique, uh, but oftentimes that critiquing what, one of the ways that doctrine has developed over time has been in in controversy. We've sharpened our understanding of scripture through controversy. Uh, so there may be, um, you, you know, you may be thinking, okay, I'm going to do something that's original because I'm critiquing some, you know, some movement or something that hasn't been critiqued before, some idea that hasn't been critiqued before, but you may actually advance your discipline in doing that. Uh, two areas uh, come to my mind as far as two areas where, where people are doing some work. Um, one area is uh, the area of progressive covenantalism or progressive covenant theology. Um, this is Peter Gentry, Stephen Wellam in um, 
over at Southern Seminary. And they're, they're working with the idea of the biblical covenants and how they fit together. Uh, and they're doing some good work, but they're also doing some work where, um, at least I would disagree with, with some of the conclusions that they're making. And I think there's room to, to interact with how these covenants, biblical covenants fit together and actually come to a better understanding than what any of the systems have, have arrived at up to this point. Um, so that's an example. And another area, um, and I saw on, on, the, on the bottom of the, the question list, there was something about um, historical background and comparative research. Um, a lot of, a lot of um, John Walton from Wheaton over here has been writing a lot of these lost world of books, the lost world of Genesis 1, the lost world of Adam. Um, I, I think that uh, a methodological critique of, of how he's approaching comparative studies, um, you know, would, would be a good dissertation topic. Um, and, I, and so those are just a few specific ideas, but what stands behind those is, you know, what, what's something that's currently um, in debate right now? Uh, that debate's not, the, the very fact that there's a debate means that there's, you know, things that haven't settled out with that topic. And so that may be a good topic, um, topic to choose. Uh, you know, another idea would be just in, in, and I don't know what area you're in, um, if you're a New Testament or Old Testament or theology, but if you're in Old Testament or New Testament, you know, there's certain passages of, um, of scripture where, you know, there's just a long-standing conundrum. And you're, if you're working through the commentary literature and you realize, okay, nobody's really, you know, I think, I, I think there's room to, to, to work with some of these difficulties here. Uh, you know, that would be, that would be another kind of idea. Or, or, or maybe if you're in theology, there's a theological topic that there's been a lot of, um, you have to be careful. You, you don't want to think, okay, I'm going to solve this theology topic that nobody's for the last 2000 years is, and, and then come up with something completely new. That's probably not going to be a wise. The, the backgrounds thing is, um, I, it's on my mind right now. It's very, very interesting. I'm in the, because I'm in the middle of uh, this book, which is, this is going more, this is from a missions class. Uh, I look, guess it looks mirror reversed on the screen. Honor patronage. It's, it's, it's coming through fine for us. Got it. Uh, kinship and purity. Um, and what he does is he goes through unlocking the New Testament culture, David De Silva, he goes through each one of those categories and he argues that the New Testament framework, the, the era, their framework for understanding those four areas was so profoundly different than ours that we have to kind of reread the New Testament through this lens. Or another big one, the honor shame thing is really big in um, mission, mission study right now. And some of that, some especially here, it's really weirding me out. Um, Um, you know, he'll work grace, like grace is now within um, like a, it's the, the structure of like a patron and client relationship. It's, it's just, he ends up reworking some really big theology categories. The thing I'm trying to process is backgrounds versus sufficiency of scripture. And how would mm -hmm. we put those two categories together? Um, in other words, I think the reason I'm, I'm interested in sharing that, that here is just to say, I do remember as a grad student thinking, how can you possibly write on anything that's original? And I think the more you get into stuff, you realize there's stuff out there like all over the place that just the topic of scripture, the theology of scripture is so huge. Even given 2000 years, we, have, <laughs> we haven't explored all this stuff or maybe a question was lightly explored. Out. And so the conversation for thinking that through. Um, so there's a lot. There's there really is a lot out there that can be discussed. And some of these things you yeah. just mentioned. What about? Oh, go ahead. What, one helpful um, one way to do to, something you could do to be original is you could bring together things that people haven't been bringing together beforehand. Mm. So, uh, for instance, with, with this whole background information, you know, when I did my dissertation, uh, I wrestled with sufficiency of scripture in terms of tradition because mm. the the theological interpreters that i was dealing with um 
were uh, very much on having tradition determine how we interpret scripture. And there's even a theological move towards that. There's, there, there's a certain segment of, um, of conservative theological writers where the arguments aren't necessarily exegetical, but they're, this, this is what this is what the post-Reformation people believed, or this is what the church fathers believed, and, and the argument saw historical. And what I, the, the paradigm, and it wasn't original with me, but a paradigm I adopted in addressing that was, um, was understanding different ways of understanding tradition. And uh, there was, in the very early church, this idea that tradition uh, didn't add any content to the Bible, but it stood as an authoritative interpreter of how, an uh, authoritative guide to how scripture ought to be interpreted. And then there was the idea that tradition came alongside and added extra information. And then the one I have to, and there's some other views as well, the one I have to for that is that tradition is, uh, is an ancillary, plays an ancillary role to, um, to uh, your theological interpretation. In other words, it's not an authoritative that, authority that stands over scripture, but it is a helpful tool. In other words, it's, it's very worthwhile to know the history of interpretation of a passage, um, not because it's going to determine, there's too many different views for it to be determinative, but, but it gives you a, a range of, okay, this is how people have thought about this. Um, some of these debates that, you, you, know, you, you know, have already been happen, ha happening, and, there's, and you get to see, oh, there's consequences of this position or that position, both just theology or an exegesis. Well, I think that same model uh, or similar model would apply to, to other things like uh, comparative studies. Is is the comparative is the is your method of comparative studies something that that is saying this is how you must interpret scripture, in, in which case it's playing an authoritative role, or is it something where, um, you know, it's an it's an ancillary discipline. It's it's providing you some very helpful background information, and you're saying. Oh, because of my cultural location, I would I would just automatically think this way. But now that I have a broader perspective, um, you know, you know, it could serve as you know, it serves as a help, but rather rather than a um, well, that's bringing together two different things that I don't think other people have brought together um, before. And so I think that would be an original contribution. The other thing I've noticed is that the people that are real focused on say the history of exegesis or the history of systematic theology and how the, they tend to be very uninterested in the background, the comparative studies and vice versa. The people that are real interested in comparative studies, they tend to be real dismissive of the historical uh, stuff because they see that as the accretions that they're trying to peel back to get back to this original comparative. Um, what happened if you, tried to develop a methodology that gave you the best of both worlds. Um, and again, I know we're kind of in the weeds with this, but, but maybe to, to bring it back out, think about things that if you read, if you can try to read widely and then you think about, okay, these people are doing this over here and these people are doing this over here. What would happen if we brought different insights from different groups together that could, that could serve to make a, um, uh, a, uh, an original contribution. Okay, let me chase that thought because it's, that's really interesting. And it connects into something that Brother Kenneth asked here. Um, he asked in the chat, where do we search to know what has been discussed before or what is currently an issue? And I, I rem very much remember that feeling. How do I, how do I get in? Um, okay, before I do that, I, there was a thought that was connecting with that that I want to make here. Part of the problem we're having here is that in theological discourse and just in human learning at large, um, the accumulation, the volume of human learning, and then the access to that information via the internet specifically, or just books in general, it's so massive that, that we're getting increasingly to where, you know, they'll say like Leonardo was the last of the true Renaissance people, which whatever, maybe. Um, but, you know, people that really had their toes dipped in deeply. Pascal is another one like that. You know, he has his toes, he, he has his hands in a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. And you, you, there's an end to that because you get to a point where to really be good at any area, you have to spend your whole life, like it takes you 30 years to get up to speed <laughs> with the conversation and really be an expert in your one field. And the result then is now we don't just have theology guys. No, yay, verily, we don't just have like 
historical theology guys. We like have like historical theology guys that are focused exclusively on the Puritans between this year and that year. I mean, like, you know, it just gets narrower and narrower. So one of the thoughts that's here, I think there's a way to push back against that. And there's, there's a trend here too, I think, or you can comment on it, but like, okay, doing cross-disciplinary stuff, cross-disciplinary can mean it's in historical theology and bringing it to bear on like a, a systematic theology question or a methodology question or something. And you're combining two old ideas in a new way. And the result that comes out of it is something pretty fresh comments you want to make there or build on that idea. Um, no, but, you know, you, so one of the dangers about, uh, about talking to one person um, is you get their proclivities uh, come through yeah. in the, in the discussion and, and my proclivity is to be general I, I mean that's that's kind of where I live I live in a generalist kind of world and to try to try to offer things but but what you what you reminded me was that okay another way to be original is to go deep and narrow um, there are things that people just haven't they haven't gone that deep before um, so it's good to just keep both of those both of those things in mind and different what people have different, yeah. different people have different gifts. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, we need the people. So there is a disadvantage if everybody goes so specialized, um, everything fragments, you need, you need the generalist as well. Uh, but the generalist is benefiting from the work the, that the specialist is doing. I almost want to argue though, and this, I'm not saying this is like a pre-commitment or something, but uh, yeah, anyway, particularly like living here and doing what I have the privilege of doing and then knowing you men individually and so forth like that. I, none of us are none of us are really shooting towards being a research professor mm -hmm. where we have a grant that we can just sit around and think about like this one narrow, you know, this one Puritan and we just pour all of our life into that into that one thing. Um, none of us are going to be there. And so in a certain sense, I think for the sake of life and ministry and what we what we will end up doing, which is probably some preaching, some teaching, some teaching on the, you know, like teen teenagers level, <laughs> maybe teaching kids. And sometimes then you're teaching on a seminary level. I mean, you end up doing all of it. There is something for the sake of ministry, this kind of education for, and this is very, very fundamental pre-commitment of, of this program. Um, for the purpose of ministry and not just as an end in itself that uh, we have at Dr. Oberlin and I trying to do planning have had this conversation. This program is intended to be a, a bit more generalist than probably another program that you would do somewhere in residence because we, all of us, you know, in the different places of ministry we have end up teaching a little bit of church history and a little bit of exegesis. None of us has the luxury of saying, no, I'm just an Old Testament guy. I don't touch, you know, any New Testament passages. <laughs> We're just is not where we live. Um, yeah. On the note of going deep, though, um, uh, one thing that just passed or hit me in passing, and this, I'm building a comment here off of something, a conversation, again, <laughs> keep on mentioning, sorry, a uh, conversation with Dr. Oberlin about intertextuality. Um, so that's something that comes up the second the last course of this year, we're doing another biblical, th a biblical theology too, and we'll go into a lot of intertextuality stuff. What do you think? Um, like, like I know Andy Nacelli did something like this. Uh, the, I, there's a lot going on in that conversation. Someone mm -hmm. could do a dissertation on one of the specific intertextuality issues, meaning we're talking about a New Testament code of the Old Testament, or I guess it could be within the same Testament, but if, theoretically, but a quote, one place in the Bible from another place in the Bible, and you're trying to figure out, or even an illusion, how do the two relate? How do we understand them in context? What do you think about that kind of paper? Yeah, I, I think that's worth investigating. That, that, that has always fascinated me. Um, ever since I was an undergraduate, uh, somebody, I, I, I remember asking the teacher, you know, does, I think I was talking about Abraham and uh, the way that Paul uses Abraham in Galatians 4. And it was, it seemed to be different than the way that, uh, <laughs> right. than the way that I was being taught in class. And I, I remember uh, the person I was talking with said, oh, well, the apostles, they could do, they could do with the Bible <laughs> what well, uh -huh. well, we aren't, what well, we can't do. And that was profoundly dissatisfying to me because yeah. uh, the apostles should be providing a model 
for how we understand uh, scripture. And I actually was able to delve into that in my dissertation. I had a whole chapter where I worked with um, with key passages and how they were used in, in the uh, Old Testament passages, that, how they were used in the New Testament. And, and, and then I was taking it a step further. What, what can we discern hermeneutically about a hermeneutical method from that? Um, and, you know, so I think there's, I, I was, some of the, maybe some of the most original contributions I was making in the dissertation uh, was in that area. Uh, I think I was putting together things that weren't quite, you know, I was using a lot of resources, but what I, what I came out in the end with some of those, I, I, I wasn't quite seen in, in the, uh, in the other resources in every case. Um, in particular with that, with that Galatians passage, I, I, I just, I started to see, oh, how Paul is using Genesis and he's using Isaiah and he's bringing these things together. Uh, and he actually is understanding them in his, in his context, even though he's speaking symbolically. Yeah, that's, that's really exciting work for me because you, you um, oftentimes you're starting with, with two passages that seems like, is, he, is Paul misusing this or is John misusing this? And the more you dig into it, you say, oh, he's interpreting his context. Oh, there's this broader Old Testament context that that verse is within. And yeah, that's really exciting work. And there's, yeah, there's bigger. The nice thing about that dissertation, that kind of dissertation topic is, um, oh, maybe we can build this thought. There's too many directions I want to go at once. But it, it that keeps you broad enough that it's going to be useful because you're thinking about some hermeneutical implications. You're doing some biblical theology stuff. You're, you've got a foot in both testaments. Um, you know, examples of this type of thing that, that strike me or that jump out in my head right now, I'm working in Matthew and I literally like yesterday was working on this right here. Um, then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah and what follows is a quote partly from Jeremiah, but it's not, most of it actually is not Jeremiah. Um, and so then if you look in the original context, it's hard to find what's going on and how to fit them together. It's a hard example. Um, but what helps a little bit, and we should know about this is a good resource for us to be familiar with. Um, so G.K. Beale, D.A. Carson commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament. They'll give you a good solid article on each one of these examples. Um, but still, the kind of like a dissertation level type of work on those, you, you could take a passage like that and you could, you could, you could exhaust the dissertation on that and really go far with it. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add there? Or? I, in general, I like, I like Beale's approach. Um, if you're, if you're going to want to chase this topic down, you're going to want to do some research in uh, how people have done this. And mm. I can pull, You know, so there's there's been stuff that's been written, and one of one of the books that has been written is by Beale, um, the right doctrine from the wrong text, and and this is actually a collection of essays from different perspectives, and so this would be a good kind of a good opening entry into the topic. Another good entry is this one here, um, New Testament uh, New Testament use of the Old Testament. The introduction to this is very helpful. Um, and he has um, what he calls five orbiting questions about this issue. Uh, so that that's helpful. Uh, and then there's just various other, I mean, there's just various other works that people have written, you know, on the topic. Um, so what you'd want to do is you'd want to get in, you'd want to get familiar with some of that literature and get into that discussion. Um, and, and it may not be that you're going to come up with a with a new approach. I, I you know, the, maybe I mean maybe so, but I think a lot of the approaches. You, what you may want to do is you want may want to take an approach. You say, okay, this is, you know, say say Beale's approach or something. Say, okay, this, so this is this is an approach where, uh, I'm going to take this and I'm going to take this to one of the hard texts, and then I'm going to test that approach and see if that approach works. Uh, with these hard passages uh, that, you know, that's an idea. It's helpful. This, don't want to lose uh, brother Kenneth's comment here about where do we search to know what's been discussed before. I um, know I was just hanging on to that because, okay. 
I want to finish out the finding a topic and then his question fits really well into the second thing, narrowing the topic, if we That's can. Great. Um, how about this? Uh, okay. I've seen topics like this and I watch this happen sometimes with guys that are working with a topic. They'll say like, okay, here's the topic I'm going to work with. And it sounds really exciting. Um, and then <laughs> six months go by and such, and they do more reading and they get out there and they find out, no, somebody's already written on that. Somebody's already written on that. And so, you know, what started out as a pretty interesting broad topic becomes this thing where it's like the view of such and such a Puritan between, you know, this decade and that decade or something. And, and the, so where he ends up with the topic sounds like the most, honestly, sounds really brain numbing. Um, I don't know. Anyway, how do, in the attempt to be original, we might go so specific that we end up with something irrelevant. How do we push back against that? Um, how broad is too broad? How narrow is too narrow? There may not be much to say here or add to it, but anything you want to put in there? Yeah, um, I, I may be the wrong person to ask that question because when I look back at my dissertation, I think I was probably too broad. I, I think I had three dissertations in one, and I may have been served by taking one part of my dissertation and, and making it a single, uh, a, a single um, part. And the reason I was so broad is I was critiquing a, a big movement, and maybe I should have critiqued a, a part of the movement instead of the whole thing, um, or tried to do the whole thing. Okay. What do you think about this? Like, here's an interesting dynamic between the two of us. Our our two topics were very different. And the more I, you know, learned about your topic and stuff you were doing, it was, uh, I said this to my wife multiple times. Yeah, Brian's topic is absolutely perfect for Brian and it would never work for me. Um, and I think vice versa as well. Um, so no, I mean, I'm sure you could have done my topic and done much better, but what do you think, like finding a topic that fits that person or I don't know, anyway, I guess my intuition here is you find something that you, not just that you're like, well, I, I can do this, but you're hoping to try to find something that you really want to do. Like something, cause you're going to need to wake up to this every morning. Um, yeah. So you don't just want to put up with it. You want to love it. Any thoughts there? Right. So, so what I did in order to be original was I critiqued this movement, uh, but I wasn't super interested in the movement, you could, you could say. I was interested in the various topics that got me into that. So I, I they were just coming out of seminary. I, I, I was really interested in, in the scripture and tradition and how those fit together. I was really interested in um, Old Testament's use of the, New Testament's use of the Old Testament and the hermeneutical issues that were involved there. And I was really interested in how biblical and systematic theology ought to work in your exegetical process. Those were the three parts of my dissertation. And, um, you know, and, and, and I was able to, to use those topics in order to, um, in order to evaluate this, this current um, movement of interpretation. So, yeah, go with, go with things, you know, as, as you've been doing study, uh, there should be certain things that have really interested you. And you're thinking, um, Oh, I'd, I'd really like to, you know, I'd really like to know more about this theological topic, or I'd really like to, to investigate this passage of scripture more. They've, they've really captured your attention. Uh, see if there's something original that can be done in those areas. You do want to have something that you want to live with for a number of years. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to, um, whatever you end up doing is going to shape your thinking in such a way, like it, Anyway, mm -hmm. there's going to be aspects of your ministry and uh, your life and ministry and stuff. That your brain's going to form around that a little bit. So, yeah. Anyway, I mean, find something that really is useful for life and isn't, isn't it isn't just going to rot in a library somewhere. But it, you're going to be able to take pieces of this and use it. And and yeah, right. Okay. Uh, in order to um, absolutely prove, Brother Kenneth, that we haven't forgotten your question. No, that's it. Led to our second thing here. So he was asking, where do we search to know what has been discussed before? What is currently an issue? And I, I very much remember this feeling. What do you think there? Um, just how to, how to kind of, you've got something you're sort of interested in, okay, but how to chase down what's happening in the conversation prior to you. 
Right. And this one may be a little bit harder because I don't know, I, I don't know the context in which everybody is is in. Um, you know, so of course, where where I was located, actually, I think I, where we were located in doing our dissertations, we had an academic library, uh, and so we could we could go through the stacks and see what's there. Um, Amazon, though, is available for everybody to to search. You know, start searching and seeing. Um, if you search on a topic or you search on, you know, it, it, maybe you know some specific books that are on that topic. Uh, see what comes up. Um, you know, they'll say if people that bought this book have also bought these other books. Sorry. I check out, you know, what other things have been written. Audience. Chase some of those, chase some, some of those rabbits on Amazon. Um, again, I don't know what resources at, at the university we had. Um, ProQuest, the ProQuest database. So we were able to search other dissertations and we could, that, that was actually pretty important when you were trying to see, has anyone done anything here? Um, you know, again, I don't know what, access, what tools people have access to, um, but, but some of those databases are helpful. There's a biblical studies, I think it's biblicalstudies.com.uk or something like that. He has a lot of resources that he's aggregated there um you know so that may give you some window into what's what's been published it's great in terms of libraries stuff that um stuff that comes on i mean i think if i'm understanding by the way the way you just referenced biblicalstudies.org.uk and it, lots of different uh like in different areas new testament old testament exegesis history and stuff like that i just dropped that in the chat um the singapore guys i think you guys have a place you can go. You have academic libraries you can access. We have some, we have some places we can go here in Manila. So that's an option. Pastor Hilarsis, um, you would, I'm sure, be the most limited in you know how proximate you are to something. Something that comes to my mind, and this probably applies for all of us. Um, you may find that at one time I did, I did this, even though I it was in Greenville and I you know right there by academic library. At one point in your study. You might need to plan a trip somewhere and go somewhere to a really large library and just do a, a bunch of research. And um, in this case, I went away for, I think it was like three days. I went up to Washington, D.C. and just sat there and took, you know, got these resources, took pictures. I didn't even necessarily read everything, but I just take pictures of pages and did that for three days. And that may be worth planning a trip like that. You know, once you get deep enough into your topic that you have some ideas of the stuff you need to find. So, so, so for, for these men, I, I mean, are there academic libraries they could travel to and a, get access to something like a ProQuest database? Is that what you're saying? There, I think Singapore would, I mean, that may probably would be the most proximate and the most expensive. Um, and then here, Manila, we can, we have some decent stuff here we can do here in Manila. So, and those are the two, I mean, everyone represented here is in one of those two places or yeah. Pastor Hilarus is, you know, from time to time, may be able to come up. Um, okay, oh, here's a thing that I just, it's worth us talking about because I don't think I got it when I was midway through grad school. By, by the time I started dissertation, I was getting it, but, um, but it's really obvious, it's embarrassingly obvious, and I should have figured it out sooner. A big way that you're doing this, you, you, so you're interested in a certain topic, okay? Find a, a good, solid academic book on that topic, and you know, Amazon will get you there or something. Just do a basic search. But once you're, you're reading that book, and this is the only way to get it up to speed, obviously, in a topic is, you know, read a number of books in that area. But as you're getting up to speed in that topic, the footnotes and the bibliography, mm -hmm. that's where you're, that's there to help you find out the big stuff that you need to read. So if um, everybody's bibliography references the same, like, four or five sources, those are your sources. Like you, you have to read those sources. Um, and so pay attention to what's getting footnoted, what's getting referenced, what's showing up in the bibliographies, also in journal articles, all that kind of thing. Um, any pointers there? No, that's, yeah, that's absolutely essential uh, is to keep track of what's showing up in the footnotes and bibliographies. And if you find, um, you know, if you find a newer book, uh, of course, they're going to have, if you, if you use an older book, the, you know, there may be stuff that's been written since that book. So you're not fully up to date. 
Uh, if you get a newer book, um, you know, that's, that's academic and orientation is giving you a lot of, yeah, that's, and then, and then, like you said, when you, so you, so you, you, you find a real good resource, you, you branch out into what's in their bibliography and then you start to see, okay, yeah, what's everybody referencing? What's everybody talking about? Those end up being your key resources. Um, for my, to my topic was a hot topic when I was writing on it. So I, I checked uh, publishers uh, websites a lot just to see if they were publishing new stuff on my topic, um, which is another. So, I mean, you, you, you could just go out to Baker, to Urban's, um, to, um, oh, you know, Kriegel Crossway, um, Oxford University Press, Princeton, you know, you just, you just go out there. I, I would just go out there on a regular basis. For me, it was the, it was more the evangelical publishers. I would just go out there on a regular IVP. Uh, and I just keep checking. Okay, what are they? What are they publishing? Is is there anything on my topic that's that's been coming out? And my topic, I didn't have as many. There wasn't as much out there that existed. But right. basically, the way it worked for me. Okay, I started with like one major source that was like the trunk of the tree, and then okay, I follow out his footnotes. And so he mentions these sources are coming up a bunch. So I go read those mm -hmm. guys, interact with those guys, and that's like the main branches of the tree or whatever. And then. I check out those guys and they're footnoting people. And so I check out, so we're kind of like going further and further. And when I got to the point where um, somebody would reference a resource and I'd be like, yep, I've looked at that. Or they would reference another resource. I think I've never checked that one out. I'd go check it out and it would be really not helpful or really not connected at all. And so when you, when you basically get to the point that most of what is most of what's getting footnoted in a reference you're at least familiar with or you've looked at it at one time and then the things that you're checking out are not helping you any then you know okay i've i'm getting to the end of the tree you know i'm like I've, i'm past the leaves now and i'm floating out into empty air this isn't helping anymore and that's right. when you know you're ready to start writing <laughs> or, or you start reading things and you're like oh yeah it's the same it's a different guy but he's saying the same thing that i've read you realized okay yeah i'm, I'm getting and you may still want to take that guy into account. Um, you, do, you don't want to just throw that resource out, but you don't have to feel like, oh, I need to really read this one deeply and carefully. Uh, it's like, okay, yep, that's, that's part of the conversation. Um, you know, but, nice. but, but you, don't, you don't need to really spend your time slowly working through that book. That's nice, that's good. Um, Theological Journal Library. Do you find that mm. helpful to use that a lot? I do. I, I do use that. And then again, I don't know what library resources, but uh, we have something in our library here called Atla or Atlas. Um, and then JSTOR. Um, so those that's an option. Um, if you're if you can get to a library that has access to those journal databases. Um, the other way that, you know, there's certain journals you say say a library doesn't have access to that, but there's certain journal articles. Well, also that biblicalstudies.org.uk, he has a lot of journal articles that he's got permission to reprint there. That so the key article on scripture tradition that I used, uh, I found on biblicalstudies.org.uk. Uh, it was, you, you know, so yeah, that's a great place to look. And then sometimes uh, there's uh, Google Scholar, scholar.google.com. Uh, you can search, you know, say somebody, say there's a certain article that everybody's mentioning and you know, you just know, I, I have to reference this article. Um, you can search for it on Google Scholar and, um, you know, maybe, maybe you don't have access to a library that could get you that for free, but a lot of times they will allow you to buy a single article. And, if it, you know, if this is a key article that may be just, just something you have to, you just have to buy. Um, another website to note is academia.edu, and this is where scholars will post articles that they've written. Uh, sometimes they're published articles and they got permission to repost it there. Sometimes they're unpublished or, or drafts. In academic work, you can't really cite the draft, um, but at least you could see the content. For in some cases, but in some cases, they actually they actually post their actual article. It's it's something that's citable, so that is definitely a site. 
that's that's worth checking out. And I found um, it, again, this is the nature of my topic. I a lot of the resources I had would li have like you know six pages or something in the whole book that actually touched my topic. Um, I could get off on a lot of the books. A lot of the books in my bibliography, I never touched it, and I never read the whole book. I used the Google Books, uh, Google Books, and then you get that preview, and you get like I don't know, fifteen pages or something. And sometimes I could get the job done just on that, or I would max out my preview on Google Books. I jump over and max out my preview on Amazon, mm -hmm. and between the two of them, I could get like thirty pages of the book, and I could cite it, and it worked for me. So I mean, that you pay no money there. Um, you can get there. I should explain just a second ago, the, um, the Theological Journal Library, that's something you'd need to buy either on Accordance or Logos. And it, I think it might run you a couple hundred dollars, uh, but there's a ton, a ton, a ton of, of theological journals in there. So, and, you know, uh, depending on your situation, uh, if, you know, if you were looking for a specific article, I can, you could message me, hey, I'm looking for this article. I could probably pull it up for you, get, it, get a copy of, you, of it for you to use. So there's some things like that we can do to work, work together and help each other out to get some access to some things. Um, okay, I'm, that's, we've talked about finding a topic. We've talked about starting to narrow the topic through reading uh, the literature and you know, working us through there. Anything you wanna add there? I have some more questions under that second, but anything you wanna add or? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say uh, that the journal, journal library is something that I have bought and used and found very helpful because it, it does give you the opportunity to, to do a big search through a bunch of journals. Um, it, I don't think that's the name that's, that Logos is currently using. And, and they have several different journal packages. You'll just have to look. Uh, if, you, if you're going to go with Logos instead of Accordance, and uh, you just have to look and see what. They have um, journal bundles, I think they call them now. And they have like a master journal bundle and a complete journal bundle and a theological journal. You know, So you just have to look at which bundle is going to maybe give you the journals um, that are going to be most useful for you. And in my mind, the, the big journals, and it maybe depends on the topic, but the big journals that I often in that package end up looking for are, is Westminster, Trinity, JETS, which is Journal of Evangelical Theological Society, um, and uh, Grace Theological Journal is often helpful. Um, and uh, BibSAC, depending on some of the older ones aren't as helpful, but some of the newer ones um, are, so. Great. That may just give you an idea if you're looking at packages. Um, for instance, I have not bought their biggest package because I didn't think all the journals in there were worth the money. I was this, this, the, I think the master journal bundle maybe is what I, I could actually pull that up and see um, is what I uh, was interested in. Um, let's go ahead and take our five minute break here. And when we come back, we can continue with these, any of these discussions we've already had. Uh, but we'll be talking also about talking also about a preliminary bibliography, getting into primary secondary literature and how this works, uh, creating a thesis. And then there's some follow up, some halo questions there at the end that I want to get to. So anyway, Please, uh, in the next five minutes, as you have a question, if you want to articulate something or drop that in there, let's do that. Um, you know, Brother Kenneth's question was helpful here earlier, and any other questions you have, uh, let's drop that in there and let's work with that. Okay, we'll come back Great. in um, one, one, two minutes after the hour, we'll pick up there. Set into our discussion. I'll just mention this while it's on my mind and before I forget. Um, something that we'll, you, you definitely should do before you get into writing your thesis is you've, you've got to read a couple of dissertations. You know, find, find two or three good dissertations that are something worth admiring, hopefully somewhere near the basic, uh, the basic topic that you're gonna be doing anyway, but some dissertations that are well done that you admire and you should read a couple of dissertations. Um, and your idea of what they do, basically the shape of what they do will shape what you do. So pick well. <laughs> um, there are plenty of dissertations out there that are like, uh, academically inflated in the sense 
you know, I'll read a paragraph or two. And I realized I could have stated, someone could have stated every idea that was in there with like 20% of the words that they used. So there's a way of writing that sounds academic y, but it's not actually communicating information. And if you can find somebody that was a good writer that communicated solid content in an uninflated way, they just, they just said it. Um, that's really a, that's going to be a great thing to read. And it's going to shape, you don't, you don't, you know, it's hard to even realize how much it's shaping your expectations till you, till you start writing, you realize, Oh, I'm accidentally copying that guy's style. So pick, pick well, <laughs> pick some good dissertations because it, it probably will become your style. Um, did you find that Dr. Collins, uh, you know, dissertations that you read helped shape the way you thought about the dissertation making business and how you went about it yourself? You know, I don't know that I probably, um, I didn't really read dissertations for my dissertation. Um, like I didn't make that a plan, but I had read dissertations, um, throughout seminary as part of other research. So I had read Brian Smith's dissertation on the Joseph Judah story. Um, I had read Roy Short's dissertation or sections of it on Exodus. Um, I had jumped into some other dissertations as well. Brian's was, was great. Brian's is well-written. He's a good writer. Uh, he was doing solid research. Um, he needs to publish. I keep telling him that. Uh, <laughs> so, so yes, I had done that, but I don't know that I had done it. Um, as thoughtfully as you're encouraging here, which, which is good. And I have Dr. Smith's dissertation. I, yeah, that would be, I mean, that would be an excellent one to choose um, because he's, I mean, it's academically solid, but it's not academically inflated and it's, he's just, anyway, it's good. So I have, I have that. Um, and I could confirm with him that I can share it with you. If that's something you're interested in, let me know and I'll shoot him an email. We'll confirm that and get it going. And I can find some other dissertations, you know, some ones that I'd recommend or that Dr. Collins, recommend. any other ones that are off, off the top of your head, like, oh, you, this is a great one to read. You know, the other one that comes to my mind is uh, A. Phil Brown's, uh, Dr. Brown's dissertation on Ezra. I'm actually studying Ezra right now for Sunday school and I'm making use of his dissertation. It's very helpful. Um, Trying to think of some others that this is this is not a BJU dissertation, but um, Ryan Martin, his dissertation on Jonathan Edwards' affections, religious affections, is uh, very good, uh, and his was actually published in a prestigious monograph series. Um, but he his his was a central. You, you may be able to get access to that, you know, through ProQuest. I'm not sure. Um, I remember reading, um, and this, it's a, he's a good guy, but I remember reading a dissertation because, um, you know, I did a couple different ones. Reading a dissertation, I thought uh, you could just tell like different levels. Like, okay, that other mm -hmm. one I read was at a very excellent level. And this felt more maybe like um, a lot of seminary papers put together, but, you know, just wasn't mm -hmm. quite at the same level and stuff like that. So that's helpful too. You see that there are different levels and, you, you know, may, you in the sovereignty of God and the limits of time and everything, time and space and effort and everything, you may, you may not be able to do something. That you're not, there's no way you're going to write a dissertation that it's going to be everything you could dream that it would be, um, you know, get the job done, but yeah, go ahead. You know, we should mention Dr. Oberlin's, Oberlin's dissertation as well. Uh, that was actually one that I read uh, he, cause he was just a bit ahead of me in school. And um, so we talked about his topic and I remember reading, uh, his dissertation. Um, so, and the nice thing there, the nice thing about his is you've got, you've got some exegesis stuff going on. Mm -hmm. You've got some biblical theology stuff going on. Obviously you do some missiology stuff. And so it starts to kick into um, some discussions. Like anyway, there's a lot of, even some systematic theology. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's that's, fun that's because nice you get a breadth. lot of disciplines. What's that? Yeah. yeah. It has a lot of nice breadth to it. Yeah. It, it's a good example of, um, where you can write a dissertation that's not so narrow, it's completely irrelevant. I've taken, mm -hmm. I've taken pieces out of his dissertation and used them in classes. 
you know, I'll take right. this kind of information and it just helps me. Art Good. Um, okay, can, let's jump to this. Um, and as always, uh, any questions you have, let's get them in the chat. But um, we need to make the distinction, tertiary literature, primary literature, secondary literature. You wanna talk about that just for a second, just so we make sure we're, we've got that distinction in our heads. Right, so um, say, that you're, say that you are researching um, Irenaeus's view of tradition, or maybe just more broadly, you're, 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 looking, at, um, you're looking at how tradition was understood uh, in the, um, in, you know, throughout church history. So when I did this in my, in my dissertation, when I was looking at Irenaeus, or when I was looking at Origen, or when I was looking at Justin Martyr, or I was looking at John Calvin or Martin Chemnitz or John Henry Cardinal Newman. Those are my primary sources. I was looking at them to see what they said about uh, scripture and tradition. So that was, uh, those were primary sources. Um, the most helpful secondary source that I looked at was uh, Anthony Lane had written a journal article in which he, he surveyed, he, he had a schema of like, seven different approaches to tradition. And he was interacting with a man named Heiko Oberman, uh, who had a different three-part schema. Um, so when I was looking at uh, what, what I actually looked at both of those articles, um, those, were, those were secondary sources. And then I could go, you know, I could just pull, you know, a theological dictionary. And if I look this up, I can look it up right now, see if they have an article on tradition. I bet they do. Uh, that would be a tertiary uh, so source. Uh, yeah, they have an article on tradition, and um, they have a little bibliography that directs me to other sources. Uh, in this case, it doesn't look like it's, well, it does. It, it, uh, it points me to one of the sources, one of the other sources that I ended up using. So, the, you you might you might want to start with a tertiary source. You might want to start with the dictionary. And again, this is this is finding um, following your footnotes. So you, you you get the dictionary, and that dictionary, a good dictionary should should get you up to speed on where the discussion is, where the scholarly discussion is at the time of that article. Um, you may not ever cite that tertiary source in your in your dissertation or your thesis. Uh, but it's a good starting place. And, and you can see, uh, again, this one, this particular article doesn't have the most helpful um, bibliography, but a, a good dictionary article could give you a really good bibliography. It, it should give you the main sources on the topic then that you want to start tracking down, the main secondary sources. And then as you uh, start tracking down those secondary sources, those secondary sources should be giving you access to the primary sources um, and then you can start checking out those primary sources and the primary sources and secondary sources, but you, you know, you really want to work. And if you're doing a dissertation or a thesis, you really want to be working with those primary sources. Um, you, you can't just depend on the tertiary sources, but the tertiary sources are a good place to begin, uh, your, your, your study. And in a way, I think that that particular <coughs> excuse me that particular distinction is a partial answer to Brother Kenneth Chung's answer, uh, question earlier. Kind of where do you get started? And so, I mean, part of the answer is you start with this tertiary on this tertiary level, right? You start on level three, and that's so. These are the really general books, and you're going to read the article, you know, ten page article or something. Um, and then once you get into a, okay, I've got the overview, then you go deeper. So you're each level, you're going down more specific or more detailed, let's say more detailed, more microscopic in your discussion. I dropped this diagram into the um, chat as well. So if that's helpful, I didn't write this by the way, <laughs> but it just help, helps, helps um, clarify, give you some examples and that kind of thing. Now, okay. it, it's also helpful to note that different sources actually depending on what you're studying can fall into different to different categories mm. so so this 
is a dictionary. So you might think, oh, this is going to be a tertiary source. Mm. But for my dissertation, because I was actually studying theological interpretation of the Bible, it was a primary source. Mm. Because here I'm getting articles where people are trying to define what is theological interpretation of the Bible. Um, so, it, you know, what, whether something is a tertiary source or a secondary source or a primary source, in some ways depends on what you're, what you're looking at. Um, you know, if you're looking at, this is not, this is a non-theological example, but if you're looking at, um, doing a thesis on World War II and, uh, so, so like letters and, 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 um, correspondence and records, those are primary sources and, uh, someone else's history that he's written based on those uh, sources uh, would be secondary sources. But say that you're writing a thesis on the historiography of World War II, and you're looking at different ways that people have written histories over that period of time. You know, how do people write it in the 1950s compared to how people are writing it in the 2000s? Well, then all those secondary source histories for you, for your project, are, are, are primary sources, uh, because that's the primary thing that you're, you're studying. I don't know if that's that helpful. Yeah, no, no, that makes a lot of sense. Right. Great. Um, okay. Um, let's talk about creating a thesis. And um, I hear I'm shifting a little bit more into kind of the once you're doing it, how do you how do you keep on going? Um, so this might get a little more personal or a little more motivational or just the, the logistics of getting it happening. Um, what do you think as far as, okay, were the, what were the biggest challenges for you personally at this stage when you're actually writing the paper? How do you keep, how did you keep yourself going? Um, yeah. My, my biggest challenge um, was the amount of information. Um, my, my topic was a, was a hot topic that everybody was wanting to publish on at the time which meant that when I was writing my prospectus, I was trying, I, I initially had those goals. I was, I was going to read everything that had been written in my topic. And, but every month, three new books or five new books were written on my topic. And I just, I spent a year just in preliminary research and working on pulling up, pulling together the prospectus. It was too much time. I should have given up sooner about trying to read all of the, all of the relevant literature. Um, so that was one of the struggles that I had. Um, so the benefit, I mean, the benefit about picking up kind of a the hot topic of the day that the publishers are publishing on is you have plenty of material to work with. The downside is you may sorting through all that. And, and, and when I was first, you know, when you're first in the perspective that you're doing the initial, you don't know at that point what the real important stuff is and what the unimportant stuff is. You're still sorting through that. And there was just a lot, there was a lot to sort through. Uh, so that was one of the struggles that I had. Um, and, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to resolve that except to say that I think I had unrealistic expectations. I should have been trying to read just the most important sources instead of all of, instead of instead of everything, um, it may have helped to narrow my topic a little bit on 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 that. Uh, as to organization, the more you read in in your as you go through the, the major literature, you're gonna you're gonna start to get a feel for okay, this is my topic, and these are the major things that I need to discuss. Um, so, for instance, I, in my topic, I just I noticed everybody's talking about uh, the role tradition ought to play in interpretation. Uh, a lot of people were talking about moving to a pre-critical, allegorical approach or to a postmodern reader response approach, and they and they were often linking those two things together. And then a lot of people were talking about how theology should actually be influencing exegesis. Um, so eventually I made those the three parts of my dissertation. Um, and then within those parts, 
this just made sense to me. Uh, I, I did chapters of historical survey where I surveyed views and then I did a chapter of evaluating the views that that I had uh, that I had surveyed in the previous chapters. Um, I tried several different outlines. Um, sketch, you know, I just had a notepad and I just sketched out different things. What are, there, I'm sure it's been a long enough ago. I, I don't remember, but I'm sure there were certain minor topics that I ended up dropping. They just didn't fit the structure. Um, sometimes you rework. Um, an entire chapter. So I, I was used to doing these chronological surveys. You know, start with the church fathers and move all the way to the present. When I got to a chapter on biblical theology, I actually initially wrote the chapter that way, and it didn't work. And I, I, I ended up moving to a topical organization for that chapter, um, because it was too, it was too long and repetitive. If I did the historical. Uh, survey one it didn't go all the way back to the church fathers so i was working with a more compressed period of time so it wasn't super helpful to do a, um, a chronological survey what i and what i really wanted were the different positions uh, so i moved to a topical approach to that one but i didn't find that out until i had you know until i'd written that chapter um there were certain chapters i wrote uh they were too long um so I had to just, you know, I had to pull material out and condense that, so. An idea that looking back, I'm, I'm just, I'm thankful for, um, but I had to learn as I went along. Um, early on, I would be, so I'm in chapter two or something, and I'm woke, looking at the certain angle. And as I'm working on chapter two, I'm reading or something, and I come along, I, I have an idea or a concept. And it's like, oh, that's a, that's a good concept. And I would think, well, that belongs in chapter five, put that aside. And mm -hmm. I learned later when that concept hits, don't throw it away because uh, you won't remember it at chapter five. So you get to chapter five, and you're like, I know I had all these concepts that were in my head, and I, but they're gone now. Um, yeah. So I would really encourage just what worked for me. You've got to find your own organizational method. But I, I had in the same document, actually, but I, I just had, you know, four pages later, chapter five, when I had a thought, I'd get it down. Um, and you could do that other ways. You could do this with one of these OneNote or Evernote things, or I don't, I mean, you could, you could get a physical notebook and have a notebook for every chapter, physically write it out, hand write it out. But when you have the idea because of the book you're reading or something hits you a spark, get it down because that sparks probably it's probably going to fade <laughs> get it down right then um thought there yes i did use uh one note to organize my dissertation mm -hmm. um i just i've never been able to the, the the advantage that i that i see to one note over evernote is you can control the organization more you create your notebook you create your tabs um you create your your pages and you can organize them in, in the specific order that you want. Um, am I able to share a screen here? I can hit the share button. Sure. Yeah. Hit share and then it'll, it'll let you choose what window you want. Got it. So, um, is that coming up for everybody now or no, I hit, to hit share. Yeah. There we got, we got something coming. There we go. Okay. Um, so this, this was my dissertation, uh, notebook and this was just my homepage. Uh, you can see I just I kept track of a schedule here. I actually did write these chapters. I just didn't check them off. Um, Today's the day. Time to mark this guy off. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I had sources here, and I just opened this up. So so I would read a book, um, and I would just take notes on that book. And, and I just put all these books here. They were just in alphabetical order uh, by the by the author, and that way I just had I just had all my sources just available here um, to look at. And I, I wonder if I can pull up a good. There's one on Spinoza that uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull it out right away that I had some good notes on, but. Anyway, I, you know, I kept my notes here. Oh, and the other thing, this, this reminded me, if, if somebody did a really good book review of that book, I pasted that in here as well. Um, and then I had uh, 
tabs for my chapters. And so I would have additional research that I would be doing on the chapter. So for instance, I did tradition in the New Testament. Well, I tried to gather all of that data um, on, on some of these pages. Uh, I mentioned Irenaeus on tradition. I was gathering, where is he talking about that? This is all just brainstorming kind of data, or, or I just want to know where all the places are that I want to refer to when I'm writing. Um, you know, so, I, so this is just, you just, you have all this data that you're trying to, um, that you're trying to collect. Um, and so here's, here's where you're, I don't have as much here. I ended up not doing this. I ended up dropping this. That's why there's not as much there. Um, you know, so just different. Anyway, so this is what I use to organize. Um, you know, organize my notes. So I don't know no. if that's helpful. It is. I'm going to drop in a comment here, though, um, just because we're all different. You know, I'm, I, I, for me, tech, the tech, technological way of doing it works for me and for you as well. Um, we're all different in that way. I, I wouldn't want you to look at that and think that that is make an equation between that and doing a dissertation. Um, let's just, Dr. Collins is an, Dr. Collins is an unusual person and the, uh, the amount of depth that he, do, he did there in the research is fabulous. So it's a great thing to shoot for. But um, I wouldn't say that every guy who does, <laughs> every guy who does a dissertation has done that breadth of reading. Um, so don't look at that and, and immediately uh, be scared to death by it. I, it certainly, I did not do that breadth of reading. Well, um, yeah, you, so. you, you're looking at where I was scrolling through my sources. Remember what I said earlier, I spent way too much time <laughs> reading I, and I should have stopped earlier and started writing. I should have stopped reading earlier and started writing earlier. So, yes. Now, now one, of the thing, oh, one of the things that was helpful, and I, I didn't actually was able to find a good example of this. Uh, oh, here's the Spinoza thing. Um, what I was able to do is, you know, I had that page where I had my notes on Spinoza, and I could create links from... Um, we don't have you anymore on the share. Yeah, because I'm, I'm uh, not sure that I actually... Okay, here it is. Let me share it again. Um, so here's my page on Spinoza, and here I've organized multiple uh, resources topically. So I have relation to Protestant scholastics, his biography, initiator of historical critical scholarship, and so forth. And then I can click on this link here, uh, and it jumps me back to, oh, this is the book I was reading, and here's the note that I have in the flow of the book. Um, so I have my notes from the sources in one place, and then as I was pulling things together topically, um, you know, I was able to, uh, I was able to organize it differently. Now, just another caution, it worked, it worked for me to do that with, with one note. Uh, different people are at different levels of comfort with uh, with different kinds of technology. And, you know, don't think, uh, uh, really a notebook and a, p and a pen, that is a technology. And that may be the better technology uh, for your for your circumstances. Um, it may be that what you wanna do is, is get three by five cards in, in, a, in a box. And, um, you know, when you read a source, you're, you're jotting notes down in three by five cards or four by six cards, or maybe you have a little, maybe you get a little notebook uh, that's going to be your sources, your notes on your sources. And so you're, you're marking down all your notes on your sources, and maybe you leave that first page blank, and you create your own table of contents there. Oh, these are the sources, this is what page they're on, and you number those pages, and you have a, maybe another notebook that you use, maybe you get a, a, a little notebook for each chapter of the dissertation, or maybe a big notebook with dividers. And instead of creating hyperlinks the way I was doing, maybe you're just writing down, oh, see my source notebook page such and such here. Um, so what I was doing electronically actually can be done 
on pen and paper if if that's the technology that you're most comfortable with. It's good. It's good. Um, okay, let's go. This is a very different direction, but I, I'm thinking here of like um, John Frame has some really good stuff. Uh, Justo Gonzalez has some good stuff in the um, history of theological education that goes this way. But John Frame does a great job with this kind of emphasis. I mean, we're talking a lot of really, really academic stuff. Um, but then this idea, hey, ultimately, any academic work you're doing is to serve the church. Mm -hmm. um, so help us, th help us think a little bit through dissertation and what I'm asking here, like what, <laughs> why? <laughs> you know, I mean, so you end up putting a year and a half or two years or more of your life in, and here our goal, I should say, our goal here, we're starting early, we're midway through the course process, we're gonna ask you to write your first chapter during the course. So basically the idea is, so it's not just stretched out over two years, but you know, take it in bite chunks. Uh, or bite-sized chunks, like eat the elephant a bite at a time. So that's our idea here. Um, but all the same, there's going to be a lot of human, uh, a lot of human hours just sitting there working on this. Um, what, how would you quantify the benefit of your having done this for your actual service to the church? <laughs> how did, how has your having done this actually helped you serve God? Um, right. So, um, I don't think the people in my church are tempted to, uh, at least in general, are, are, are tempted to read these theological interpreters that I was reading. Um, they're, they're more likely to be dismissive. When I describe what, how they were approaching the Bible, they're more likely to be dismissive. So my, my dissertation didn't have a direct application to... Um, to people in the church as the dissertation. But um, last, last year, I taught at the Bind Sunday School for our whole church on a topic that really uh, was of, of great interest to everybody in the church because of challenges they really do face. And that is, how do we know that the canon of Scripture uh, really is what God intends us to have? And there's various challenges in the United States and probably spread around the world, men like Bart Ehrman, other men that really cast doubt on, on the, or, or you meet a Roman Catholic. Uh, I had a, this, this, this actually was, became of interest to me uh, because of an evangelistic opportunity I had with a Roman Catholic friend who was on his way to the priesthood. And he would just say, there's no inspired table of contents. Sola Scriptura breaks down at the canon. You need the church to determine the canon. And I knew that was wrong, uh, and that was part of my interest in this idea of what role does, does tradition play in, uh, in Scripture. So anyway, when I taught that Sunday school lesson, I was able to draw on, on the research that I had done with the dissertation. Uh, so that was very, very directly applicable uh, to the church. Um, some of the specific passages that I was able to investigate for the dissertation uh, have been, you know, things I've been able to teach. Uh, this year for a combined Sunday school class, uh, we've been studying, um, at, at our church, we have what our pastor calls triology theology, and there are questions and answers about uh, major theological topics. And so he wanted us to, he wanted me to teach a lesson on how systematic theology, which is basically what we're doing with those questions and answers, helps, um, helps us interpret our Bible as we do our Bible reading every year. And I, I was able to draw directly from the dissertation for that. I had to make it, you know, I was working to make it accessible for everybody in the, in the congregation because not everybody's, you know, on dissertation level, but all that material is material that I was, that I was using, um, you know, right, right in, right in the church. Let me throw out a couple of things that come to my mind. Um, something that will help you if you choose the right topic you can find that you can use a lot of the pieces of your dissertation work and i i would say almost every chapter in my dissertation has found its way into some kind of teaching or preaching discussion obviously not on the academic level that it was in the dissertation but um in some kind of form where i'm explaining it in a different way absolutely it's found its form in there 
Um, and I would tend to say if I look back on the writing or the classwork and the dissertation phase, those feel like I learned in seminary, it was like 50% was class and 50% was the dissertation. In other words, what I mean by that is I think I learned as much in the process of writing a dissertation as I did in all of my classwork that came before. Mm -hmm. And here I think is the reason for it. Um, do you know how this works? You, you go and you sit down and you listen to a lecture or a sermon even. Um, and so you, you hear some things and you learn some things. But the person that learned the most by a long shot the person that learned the most in the room was the guy who prepared the lecture or the guy who prepared the sermon. Cause the guy who prepared it had to do twice as much work. And then you're sitting there, you just came in, you just sat down, you listened to him speak. You don't, you don't get everything he said anyway. So it was the guy really by writing or by creating, that's really where the learning process happened. Um, okay. I think that's the deal. That's why for me, I learned as much from the writing, my dissertation as I did from the classes, because during the classes I came in and Dr. Talbert got up and dished out all kinds of brilliant thoughts. And I sat there and got like, you know, 30% of what he had prepared. Um, and so, you know, I got some stuff, but it was when I had to sit down and write and I had to create, then I think that's where the stuff really started happening. Um, so I think you'll discover that. I think you'll find that by doing this, you go, whoa, some, just some brain cells are really starting to, just, you're starting to grow some brain cells, um, which is gonna take me one more direction, and that is this. Um, the dissertation, writing the dissertation, it will, it, if the Lord allows you and leads you to do this, you will go deeper in on one topic than you'll ever go for the rest of your life into any other topic. I mean, Lord willing, maybe you, maybe you, some people do, but probably chances are, if you're a normal human, uh, this is probably the deepest you'll ever go into any topic. And I think the experience, just the opportunity to go really deep on one topic, um, it's, a, it's a very transformative experience. Um, kind of, think of it like the same way, I, I have done some running, um, and I found that if I trained for like a, a, run, a longer race, like a half marathon, or trained for a full marathon, you do the full marathon when you get done with that, because what is it, 40, 40 something, 40, 42K? You do the 42K, now a 5K or a 10K sounds like, oh yeah, whatever, that's just a weekend race. Um, and I think that sort of works the way for the dissertation a little bit, is it will become, it's like a stretching thing. You went really big, really big. So then writing a, a 20 or 30 is like, Okay, and it just helps, it helps kind of reset the calibration um, of what we're thinking about, you know, as we do, do reading and writing and study and stuff like that. Does that create any thoughts there? Or what do you think? It does. It, it reminds me that um, I did find, you know, so we, we had all written a bunch of 20 page papers for, on different topics for seminary. This really was a new and starting mm. an experience to, I mean, you're basically writing a book mm. and writing a book's right. different than writing, um, you know, a 20 page paper. And one of the things that helped me was to try to think, I mean, you mentioned that some dissertations are just a string of seminary papers together. And, and you could look at that dismissively, but you could also look at that as a, as a strategy. Right. Um, right. Instead of, instead of being overwhelmed by, the amount that you have to write, think, okay, each of my chapters is like a paper. Now you want, the chapters have to cohere. You, they need to flow one to another, but you've written a 20 page paper before. You could write a 20 page chapter um, and, and just take them a chapter at a time. Um, that, that helped me, that helped me manage. You know, how do I, how do I even approach this? That, that was helpful to me. Absolutely. And motivationally, setting really profoundly helpful for me was uh, setting goals. I, my simple thing was, okay, I'm just going to write a page a day. Mm -hmm. um, or at one point when I, my workload was less and I could focus a bit more, okay, I'm going to do two pages a day. Um, and if I could get those two pages that day, 
that was what I was shooting for. But every day I had to get my two pages, just every day. If I missed a day, I had to catch up. Um, that, that just kind of helped. Yeah, being, being on a regular schedule of writing is, um, is really uh, important. Even if even if you go back and you get rid of what you wrote the day before, mm. just just being in that pattern of writing. Um, mm. the, the other thing is is try to arrange your schedules where you get big chunks of time. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, I, I was realizing I wasn't meeting my dead. I, I was going to fall short of my deadlines, and I went to my work and I said, "Can I?" I know I still need to work 40 hours, but can I work 40 hours Monday through Thursday? And that gave me both Friday and Saturday uh, to work on the dissertation. And that was huge for getting things done. Um, you know, do a dissertation time. I have a, I have an actually an app on my computer called focus me and I have it scheduled to turn internet off at certain times of the day, just regularly. And then I can hit a button that can turn it off for an hour or two hours. If I really need to focus on something, you know, take your phone, leave it in another room, turn the internet off. Um, you know, just get away from distractions. And, uh, and re I, I read an article yesterday about uh, university professors. And they said university professors would be, would be better off if they didn't have email because they need long periods of uninterrupted concentration. And, and you really do need to, to try to strategize to get that kind of time to think you really need to think you need time to you need time to not just put stuff down but to think about what you're writing and to, and, and to think about uh, am i right am i wrong what are these people saying you need some and then it just i work i work at a press and uh, my job isn't my, my job isn't the writer's role but i do actually fill the writer's role in certain projects and the thing that's most time intensive and most difficult is when i have to write something writing takes a lot of time and, and a lot of thought. Um, so there's a good book. I really, I, that's helped me, uh, deep work. I, mm -hmm. you probably remember the author. I don't remember the name of the author. I don't remember um, the name of the author, but I think Cal. he was the one. What's that? First name is Cal. And I'll think of the name later. <laughs> anyway, I think ahead. he was the one that wrote this, the article that I was reading yesterday though. Okay. It's Cause good. I, he referenced his book. It's good because it basically his contention is um, you, it takes sometimes, and I think this is really true dissertation type work to go into deep thinking. It can take you 30 or 40 minutes to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, Dr. Threlfall, uh, the one who spoke for us for apologetics, and then he'll come back in two lectures, I think. Dr. Threlfall told me this when he was writing his dissertation. He said, I realize sometimes it takes me 30 minutes or an hour to get into the mode. Um, and then I'm there and it, uh, you know, you really start creating at that point. Well, so then to have an interruption or a phone call or stop and do an email or something just kills you um, mm -hmm. and really, really pulls you back out of the, it pulls you back into the shallows. So anyway, yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think it's a very good practical suggestion. Um, okay, I'm about to pull us in another direction. Anything we want to add there or, or, or are we good? Well, I just noticed a, a, um, a question from Kenneth would have helped if I had a roadmap um, and I just noticed it. So I'm not sure where that came up, but is, is there something you want us to follow up with there, Brother Kenneth? This might fit. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, Your mute is on, I believe. I just unmuted you. Great. Huh? You did. <laughs> okay, no, um, no, you were talking about just now when you were covering topics and then, um, uh, you know, and if you, you come across something and then you want to take note of it before you, so I was just wondering if you, if you had a roadmap, would that have helped to, to like piece together uh, chunks of information when you have it in different places? Yeah, I wonder if he was picking up, Joel, where you said if you had an idea and you said, oh, that's going to come up in Chapter 5, no. you want to capture that. No. Um, so I don't know if you want to field that one. I, I remember at different points because anyway, I don't know. It's just as you go along, you're, you're exploring I and mean, you, you kind of like walk out into this great big 
you want to think of like a, a wooded, wow. wooded area or forest or something, you just walk out into the forest and it's just all trees. Um, and then you, you kind of have to wander around a little bit and then you start to notice patterns or areas and stuff like that. Anyway, I remember at multiple different stages, stopping, whoa, stop and clear all the books off my desk. For me, this just worked for me I'd get a blank piece of paper and a pen and sit there and just start like, okay, I mean, even drawing or okay, this idea, how does that relate to this idea and just brainstorming. So yeah, I mean, there's these moments where it's like you've accumulated so many discrete pieces of information and they're all rattling around like marbles in a box and you've just got to stop and figure out what are your boxes going to be or how are you going to organize the thing and yeah i think you will i think you'll find times when you just have to s s get a clean piece of paper and and create a road map or figure out where you're going but you don't you don't, can't do that until you've acute, you've got a lot of marbles in your box to start with so yeah it's and, kind of a back and forth right and then even after you have the road map you might have an idea that jumps ahead, you know, to something else. And, and I think what your, your comment was there is, was jump ahead and actually write something down, maybe file that off and, and you'll come back to it, but you need to get it down on paper, go back to where you are on the roadmap. And then when you get back there, then you have that idea captured that you can build on. That's good. It's good thoughts. Okay. Um, I want to get this from you because you're here. And so, this is, a, this is stuff that I think would really help us. This question that I, I sent you before, kind of this concept in medicine, there's reference ranges. You know, I just, had, I just had my blood taken the other day. And so they gave me this report of where everything was. And they say, so you're uh, cre creatine or something. Anyway, CREA is the first part. It's like this. Uh, okay, is that good or bad? Um, so I want to know, you know, oh, well, between 24 and... 36 is normal. Oh, okay. Well, I'm a 20, 28. Sounds good. Right. You just don't have any. Can you do this for us with historical theology? And I'm asking you to do this because you did this for me. Um, you know, you say like, what was going on in the medieval era with this or that idea? What was going on in the, you know, the post Nicene apostolic? You know, you just, you need, you need like some reference ranges. Who's a good representative or a major figure that if you're going to talk about, um, you know, the late medieval era, you have to have looked at that guy. Um, can right. you just bump through and give us some figures that we really, really, really have to look at in order to do a historical survey of a certain concept? Yeah. So early church, the, the big earliest uh, theologian is going to be Irenaeus. Um, Super influential early on, Irenaeus. I mean, there's others, Justin Martyr, your apostolic father, but Irenaeus is the main guy. Um, and then I would say, uh, especially if you're doing, dealing with hermeneutics at all, your biblical interpretation, Origen is huge. He had a huge influence. Um, when you're thinking about the Trinity, you're thinking the Cappadocian fathers, Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, Basil the Great. Um, John Chrysostom. Is probably in there, but maybe not as important as, you know, the, the huge one is Augustine. Augustine is absolutely huge for the West. I mean, you think of somebody writes a major work. Irenaeus wrote Against Heresies. That's his major work. Augustine wrote three major works on the Trinity, uh, the City of God, and uh, what was his third? Oh, his Confessions. There were three different, I mean, they're huge. He's just a huge influence. As you move into the medieval period, period, the main medieval guy is Peter Lombard in Lombard Sentences. That was the theological textbook that everybody used from the twelve from the twelve hundreds all the way up into the Reformation. Uh, Martin Luther studied out of Peter Lombard's uh, sentences. That was the textbook. If you study theology, you study with Peter Lombard sentences. That was your textbook. So he's huge. He's also gathering, that, that textbook is an original work. He's gathering what the church fathers had said, largely Augustine. Uh, so that's a good retrospective, too, on how the patristic era was understood. Thomas Aquinas is also huge uh, for the medieval period. Um, and he's also significant because even though he didn't displace Peter Lombard in the medieval period, he, he became the major textbook for post-Reformation Roman Catholicism. So he's big. Uh, for that reason as well. You have some other people like John, John Duns Scotus and so forth, but I, I would say medieval period, 
Peter Lombard, um, Thomas Aquinas. When you get into the Reformation, of course, Martin Luther and John Calvin are two big figures uh, there. You have some, some uh, after, after uh, Luther, you do have some other significant Lutherans. Martin Chemnitz would be one. Johann Gerhard would be another. And then in the post-Reformation period, um, there's just a number of guys. And I've just picked a few that I thought I need to get to know. Uh, and the guys that I picked would be, one of them is Hermann Witsius, W-I-T-S-I-U-S. He was an early Dutch uh, post-Reformation theologian. In English, um, and he's been translated into English. That's, I don't read Dutch. Um, uh, in English, though, a native English writer is uh, John Owen, the Puritan. He's just had, is just massive. Uh, Thomas Goodwin is another Puritan that I've decided I, I really want to get to know him. Um, Jonathan Edwards is all, often called uh, America's uh, greatest theologian, greatest philosopher. He's idiosyncratic in some ways, so you want to be careful, but but he's worth getting to know. Um, if you want to broaden out in other traditions, John Wesley is, uh, and I've done some reading in, Ar in Arminius as well, just to get some, some um, other traditions in there. Um, the Princetonians are, are important, uh, especially B.B. Warfield. Um, he's kind of the apex of the Princetonian tradition. And alongside him, uh, Gerhardus Voss, they were neighbors. Uh, Voss, though, brings in a Dutch tradition, uh, and Herman Bobink for systematic theology, his Reformed dogmatics, and you might say, well, I'm not Reformed in theology, but he's still somebody to reckon with. Um, so when I did my paper on limited atonement and soteriology, I, I ended up disagreeing with his position, but his, you know, so here's a source thing. I went, I went to his systematic first, his, his Reformed dogmatics first. I knew he was going to give me all of the biblical passages. And so that's where I, that's where I went first to get that data. He was also going to be, give me a, a history of, of that, how that doctrine had developed throughout time. Uh, and he's up into the early 20th century. So you get a nice, you get a nice sense there. So, so yeah, when I'm getting to Warfield in, and, um, and uh, Bob Inc. and Voss, you're, you're into late 19th century, early, early 20th century. Or is that, is that a good, helpful? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Bob Inc. is, uh, Dr. Collins got me into Bob Inc. And uh, I mean, very, very helpful for both of those things, but the exegetical and then the historical. You had that four set, just that four volume set, just buy it. It's good. Yeah, what I like about him is that... He, um, good. Okay. okay. Go ahead. No, talk. What I like about him is that when he does systematic theology, he starts by gathering all of the biblical data, and then he does a historical survey, and then he does, he kind of wraps things up together. And so again, whether I agree or disagree with the topic, I'm getting a lot of helpful information uh, from him. That's great. Okay, I think that's all we'll do. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk for a few seconds about preparing for our next lecture, but uh, Dr. Collins, thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you. Oh, for thank you. Today. I really enjoyed it. We will look forward to hearing from you, hopefully in the future. Appreciate your time here. Um, okay, just a couple of notes for, this is more logistical, but Dr. Stikes coming in. The, uh, the plan there is to go for Monday. So I know Thursday to Monday, it's a little little closer here. Um, we're only meeting once a week for these coming weeks, um, but this worked for Brian uh, today, this Thursday, and then normally I think going forward will be on Mondays, if that works okay for you. Any feedback there? If, if you're looking at your schedule and one of the days works better than the other, let me know, um, and we can, try to, we can try to go for Mondays or Thursdays, but for now, I'm shooting for Mondays. Um, so if we can tune back in on Monday, here, preparation for that. Could you go ahead and get, and some of you, we've already done this in previous classes a year ago, but given more time and life and um, just thought, um, can you zone in on 
a handful of topics that you're really interested in doing this and by doing as your as your for your paper and by zone in i mean really we're we're at a point here where you're saying this is something i i really want to do this <laughs> um and one of the things we'll do with dr stikes i'll have each one of you bounce your topics off him so you'll just you'll propose a topic and he can give his viewpoint or things that occur to him does that sound like a good topic how can we sharpen it is it too narrow is it too broad or some avenues that maybe you should pursue and explore um, so that's one of the ways we want to maximize the time with him but in order for that to be maximally beneficial for us um, really you know we, we want to bring in at least at least three topics each things that you're interested in if in preparation for that you want to correspond i can correspond with you about it we can chat some um, so feel free don't be please don't be bashful at all i'd love to uh communicate some and you can bounce them off me so that we can narrow in and get down to a couple for him on monday so any questions about that clear enough or you know basically what i'm asking for there um so that we can maximize that time and then then the roadmap from here as we've said is really i mean that's that's why i'm wanting i'm wanting us early here let's go ahead and get a, some topics proposed start bouncing it around because at the end of the class the goal is to go ahead and have a first chapter a prospectus and first chapter um which is ambitious and you know yeah but it's we're going to shoot for it so any questions or any feedback anything that we want to um chase further there or if you have thoughts about just the you know your your own pursuit or how this is looking for um, how to use the next couple of months here with this. We can work with them. So, okay. If not, um, let's just stay in touch. And so feel free message me by Facebook messenger, email, whatever works. Uh, let's stay in touch and we can communicate between now and Monday. And then Lord willing on Monday, let's bounce some topics off Dr. Stikes. Um, and, and see how this goes. I hope from the discussion with Dr. Collins, I hope it's not overwhelming. I, you know, Dr. Collins, uh, he's extremely thorough. And um, so I would say the, the kind of research that you saw represented even like in the OneNote and stuff like that, that's a very high level. He sets a high, very high bar. Um, it's not that every dissertation has to, to be at that level. Mine certainly was not. So uh, don't let that overwhelm you. Uh, it's a great thing to shoot for, but uh, you know, I'm doubtful that um, you know you're going to be able to just jump straight up to that level. Dr. Collins is a rare, a rare guy, but anyway, by God's grace, if this is a thing He's called you to do, um, it's a step-by-step -step process. You just put one foot in front of the other. Write the next page. Write the next two pages. Just keep on going page by page, and then one day you wake up, get up one morning, and it's done. <laughs> so uh, that's it. You know, just you just keep on hacking away at it. Um, okay, so we'll stay in touch and uh, um, Lord willing, look forward to seeing you on Monday with Dr. Stikes. If there needs to be any kind of change, then I, I will definitely communicate that with you and uh, let's stay in touch. Thank you to all. We will see you later on. See you next week.